Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the latest webinar from the DuPont Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging Team. We are excited to spend this time with you sharing our learnings about the physics of peel strength coming out of our Tyvek Medical Packaging Transition Project. We know your schedules are all busy and we are appreciative of your taking time to join us. My name is Jennifer Binokin and I am an MDM and Regulatory Specialist with the Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging Group in North America. I'll be the moderator for today's session. Prior to jumping into the discussion, I wanted to share a few pieces of housekeeping. First, today's webinar is copyright 2020 by DuPont Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging. The presentation materials are owned by and copyright by DuPont Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their own content and opinions. Second, if at any time you're experiencing troubles hearing the discussion, please check your equipment by unplugging it or plugging it back in, um, and or if there are others in your household that may be streaming uh, services during this time um, that are on your network, they may be slowing the connection down a little bit. If all else fails, log off and back in. Third and last, um, regarding questions, we fully expect and welcome questions throughout the webinar. Because we have so many people on the line, we have set it up to have you submit your questions in the window on the side of your webinar tool. During the session, as questions come in, I will bring them up to Jose to address in the moment. We may not be able to get to all questions during the session, but we'll make sure that to follow up with you later if needed. We also have built in extra time at the conclusion of Jose's presentation for more questions. Without further ado, our presenter today is Jose Arevalo, Global Business Development Manager with Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging Team. Jose has been with DuPont for the last 15 years. You'll see him at the top of the screen um, at this point. And he has extensive knowledge of medical device packaging from pretty much every perspective. If you haven't met him in person already, I hope you have the opportunity to do so at some point in the future. He's got some great experiences to share with us today. Um, Jose resides in Miami, Florida, and when he's not working, you can probably find him traveling to some far off place during normal times, chronicling life with his camera or flying his drone. When you meet him, make sure you ask him about my favorite drone story that he's got. It's a pretty good one. Jose, with that, let's dive right in. Perfect, and welcome everyone to our webinar here on the physics and science of sealing. Uh, we decided to have two seminars, one this morning here in the uh, United States and one this evening for our friends in uh, Asia and around the world. So uh, glad you could join us and really appreciate taking the time out from your day or evening uh, to uh, participate in today's seminar. So as Jen said, we welcome questions. So during the seminar, feel free to just type in some questions and in the background, they will be filtered and we'll find the relevant ones and, and talk, but they all will be addressed eventually. So uh, let's, let's get started. So the genesis of this whole entire project really started with what we call the transition protocol. So five, six years ago, what we actually were doing was we were transferring from the old lines or the, uh, uh, the legacy Tyvek lines to the newer lines, right? And in that process, we wanted to make sure that the new material was functionally equivalent to the old material. And so in doing so, we really, really had to make sure that that was the case. So we had 15 people in a lab make and open 1.1 million packages, right? So that, that's a lot of packages and that's a lot of uh, seal data that we got and peel data that we got. And so from that work, one day I was uh, in the office of one of our rocket scientists and said, hey, uh, what do you got? And he showed this stuff to me. I said, this is incredible. This is groundbreaking, this is important. And so today's seminar is really based on that information from the transition protocol. It's really based on a lot of data and a lot of science, right? So that we could make sure first and foremost that the legacy and the transition topic was functionally equivalent. But now we're going to use that data and that information to really help the industry kind of look at peeling and sealing from a different perspective and we'll talk about those in more detail so here we're gonna we're gonna show a video and this is kind of something that most of you if you are familiar with with uh, uh peeling you will understand what's going on here so on the top we have someone who is actually by hand pulling on the sample so this is a, a handful 
We're not using an instrument. The person there on the side with the sticks is actually just holding the edge of the film itself. And so that film is gonna be moved around with those sticks. It just makes it easier to move without getting in the way. And then on the bottom, you can see there's the, the, the screen and it's going to read uh, pounds per inch in terms of strength from the peeling that we're going to be doing, okay? We're using two materials, uh, polyester poly on the top and on the bottom a forming film. It's just two materials sealed together. And we're gonna take a look at what happens during this process. So as you can see here, if you give me a second here to start up the video, what you will see here is that we start off and it's somewhere in that 0.64 range there at 90 degrees. And now when we go all the way to the top and we pull on that, we're gonna see a range of 1.14 there was the high point. And then back to 90, you can see, and then back over here to, to 180 at 0 0.57, 56 or somewhere in that neighborhood, right? We are, all we're doing is changing the angle of the pull and we are getting radically different numbers, right? So from zero degrees, we got 1.14, at 90, we got a 0 0.64, and at 180, we got a 0 0.57. Why is this happening? Why do we have twice the peel strength, right? when we just change the angles in the back. And one of the things that we are going to do in this presentation is explain to you exactly why that's occurring and what are the factors associated with that. And we're gonna talk a little bit also about the science behind that to really try to understand what's going on when it comes to peel data. Now, here's another example, right? And in this particular case, we're gonna take the peel strength for Tyvek with a polyester and polyethylene. Right, and so as you can see here in the 90 range, right? So if you look at the little picture on the bottom and then you look at here, so this here is gonna be 90 degrees. And if I was to pull this and keep this at a 90 degree steady state, you're gonna see that's going to be your, your blue color on the screen. When I start going here this way with towards the, the Tyvek itself at 135, that's gonna be that uh, kind of lime green color there. And then when we go all the way and do a 180 back against the Tyvek itself, that's gonna be the dark green color that you're gonna see on the screen, right? So in these orientations, 90, 135, 80, you can see there's a range that it's in, but it still stays within a certain given amount of range. But here's the fun part, right? When we look at the 45 degree, right? Now I'm doing, and I'm bending back towards the film side. So I'm coming back over this way towards the film. And then here, you can see, I'm sorry, when we go to zero to 30, so when we're actually bending completely back on the film itself and peeling back this way, it's almost up to, in this particular force, it's a different measurement system here, but it's almost at 1,000 compared to 250, so it's almost a four-fold increase if I peel it back towards the film as compared to peeling back towards the tie back, right? Jose, there's a question on the line asking well, if this means that there's a specific way that we should be telling our customers how to peel these pouches. Great question. Um, uh, and there's lots of different ways to answer that. And so at the end user level, so the nurse or who, the lab tech or whoever is that's opening these products and putting them into the sterile field, they're already doing it from a personal experience standpoint, right? So if it's a long package, they usually lay it on their arm, they grab the, the, uh, the, the web and they open it this way. Most of the time, most of the techs will open it with the clear side so they can see the product and see where it is right, as they're opening, right? Some people open it like this, some people dump it. It's gonna be a, a quite a, a, a variety of ways that people have opened over the years. So I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to educate the end user and saying, oh, only open from the Tyvek side up or only open from the film side. Just like, uh, I think a great example is yogurt, right? So we all get our yogurt and we all have different ways of opening the yogurt, but we find a way that we open the yogurt so that we minimize the amount of possible spilling or explosion that occurs as we open the yogurt, right? So we all develop all those habits. So I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to, to, to tell an MDM, or I'm sorry, uh, a doctor, a nurse, or somebody how to open something. But really this is more for your information 
from a, a testing standpoint, from a quantification and a quality, you know, kind of an understanding standpoint, right? What is going on? And then how am I going to develop my testing and understanding of this peel number? And what's it mean to me? So let me go through more of the presentation. We'll give you more details, but right now my short answer would be I'm not sure that we can recommend which side but it's important to know that each side is different and radically different and we're going to show you why so um and, and thank you good question keep the questions coming and if you have any more just go ahead and follow up with them uh so really why does it change right and you know why does it matter which material which side now in order to explain this, we have to kind of step back in time a little bit, back to high school, college, sometime in your previous past. Does anybody remember the first law of thermodynamics? So see if you can remember, because it's coming up, and here it is. Oh, we're going to go to it right now, actually. Well, no, we're not. Hold on. I'm coming back to it. Hold on to that thought, all right? Hold on to the first law of thermodynamics. In the system peel strength, right, it's actually very, very complicated what's actually happening at that point where I'm actually just, you know, starting to initiate that seal open, okay, and I'm starting to peel this open, very complicated. So we came up with a mathematical formula that I'm going to get into a little bit later on in terms of trying to quantify what's going on. But before we start all that, I want to clarify two terms, right, that we're going to use. And you know, the literature out there, F88, does not clarify it. Most of the people use these terms interchangeably, but I really want to be deliberate about using these terms in a very specific way. First, seal strength. When I talk about seal strength, I am talking about what is the strength required to keep two things together and then to pull them apart. It's just going to be straight pulling apart. What is the strength of that seal holding it together? And then what is what is that strength to pull it apart? What's that seal strength to pull it apart? Peel strength, on the other hand, involves some of that seal, but it also involves this angular kind of action where I'm actually doing something and bending materials and opening the package, right? So seal strength is this, and peel strength is this kind of adding angles and kind of opening it up. And there are very different things that are going on in those two different states, and we'll talk more about that in a few seconds. Now, let's go back to Jose. Right, one more question that just came in, um, oh. and and I know the answer, but I want to make sure that everyone on the phone or on the call knows the answer. Um, the question says, maybe I missed it, but was the Tyvek or the film coated with sealant? No, no. So in this example that you saw, so if we go back to this example here, right, and I presume that's the one we're talking about, this is your standard polyester polyethylene pouch, right? So just your standard pouch and this sealant layer, and we can get into the whole technology behind this, this layer and the, the doping agents and all the things involved with this, but we're not gonna get into that in this discussion, but it's straight kind of uncoated material. If you have a coated material, uh, some of these things will not work, and I'll talk more about coatings and cohesive films and their interactions on this later on but for now just hold on to that thought i will come back to it uh, but we did not use a code but we need to talk about coatings and uh cohesive films and we'll do so later on so good question thank you um first law of thermodynamics here we are i was ahead of myself i'm so excited with science i love science i was, I was one of those geeks as a kid by the way so the first law of thermodynamics is that energy is neither created nor destroyed right it is only just transferred to change from one form to another. So we're just transferring energy from one state to another state, right? We're not destroying anything, we're just transferring. So what does this have to do with packaging? And it's the following. One of the phenomena that happen when I am opening something or I am using a material is that I have some level of deformation occurring. I am deforming the material itself, right? And that deformation can take two different forms. First one would be an elastic deformation, right? So if the material is stretchy, like a rubber band, I can pull on the rubber band as I'm pulling on it, as I'm pulling it apart. The action of pulling it apart is putting energy into the system. The rubber band is absorbing that energy, right? And then when I let go of the rubber band, it snaps back 
and that energy is released. So it's absorption through the resistance, right? And so it's deforming what we call elastically. It's an elastic deformation. So it can stretch and come back, stretch and come back. That's elastic deformation, okay? And the energy, the rubber band absorbs my, my force to pull it apart. That energy is being transferred into the rubber band and absorbing it. And then I release it, it returns back to its normal state. The second form, is what we call inelastic deformation, okay? So now what's going to happen is that I am gonna stretch like a, you know, a little shopping bag, right? And I'm gonna stretch it, but this time it's not gonna snap back. It's just completely absorbing and it's permanently deforming that material. So that's called inelastic deformation, right? So the two things that are gonna happen is we're gonna have some level of Elastic or inelastic deformation, and in both those cases, what we are doing is those materials are absorbing energy, right? And in the absorption of energy, if we have an instron, and if you know an instron is just a machine that basically does pull testing and it does it at a certain rate, well, the dial that says what that force is, the more deformation that is involved then the higher the number that we will see on that gauge okay more deformation higher the number on that gauge now here is a, a nice picture of um just one setup this is a setup that i i would recommend if, if you don't if you're you know trying to figure out what kind of setup you want to do and what you can see here is you see the the clamps here right so on the clamps there are holding the bottom part of the actual sample itself in the back here, we have what's called a backing plate. So you have a plate that the, the tail will, will rest against so it doesn't you know, go against and it tries to keep the material kind of at a 180. And then on top of here, you can see here, we have another clamp that's holding on the top piece of the sample. And then this is going to move up and pull. As I'm pulling apart, materials and the interaction of the materials are going to deform and they are going to absorb energy and in doing so i'm going to have a larger number on my instra right so as i deform energy is absorbed larger number on the actual instron right so we're going to see a higher value as i because i'm 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 i i'm required i'm using more force to pull it apart which means i'm adding more energy because those materials are resisting right they're just resisting and so that's called deformation right very important concept to, to understand so two concepts that i want you to kind of focus on right now that we've talked about first seal strength peel strength right seal is just this peel is the act of opening very distinct kind of actions and so just want to be clear that those are separate and that when it comes to the number on the dial that we are reading in our machine that we're using to pull apart that it's also registering deformation of materials okay so Let's, let's move on, let's keep going. Uh, unless there's any questions, please just uh, type them up, send them in. Let's go back again. Seal strength is this, pulling apart. Now, I wanna introduce a couple of other things at this point. Not only is, are we gonna talk about the word seal strength, but we're also gonna use another word, true adhesion or intrinsic adhesion. And in the formula that we're gonna use later on, we're gonna use the G sub C, to stand to to represent seal strength or true adhesion or intrinsic adhesion this strength that's required to just separate something apart from itself from the other side okay seal strength intrinsic adhesion g sub c okay now peel strengths different issue right so now we have peeling mechanics that are involved right and so now what's happening is that as i am opening this product as i'm opening this package guess what i'm doing see you can see i'm i'm pulling on this so i'm going to be deforming materials here elastically or inelastically as i open the material itself right the angle at which i open this right which you saw earlier right in the videos the angle in which I open will play a major role in how much these will deform, how much the materials will deform, right? 
And as you increase deformation, then you're going to need more energy going into the system, which means that number on the dial is going to be greater. You're going to, it's going to look like a, a bigger number in terms of what the instron is reading. So let's just explain that concept again. So we have intrinsic adhesion, right? Or G sub C or seal, right? What we're calling the seal value plus the deformation value. So what's happening with the film? Is it stretching elastically, inelastically, and what's happening? That is also absorbing energy in, in the system. And that's what's going to give me the system peel strength, right? The peel strength of the entire system of everything that's going on. You've got the deformation going on, and then you got the intrinsic adhesion, and that's what will give me the system peel strength. So there you see a formula, the system peel strength, right? Is that intrinsic adhesion plus all the additional energy that's being absorbed by these materials, right? All the resistance that's happening in the process of opening a package. So let's talk about this. I mean, you, you, I think already by this point know the answer, but in this particular example here, what you see on, on one side is we have a polyester, polyethylene, right? And then on the, on the bottom, we have a forming film, and this just happens to be a, a, a C film that we're using in this example and we just use films right now to look at this this is not a tyvek related phenomena this is a phenomena between two sealed uh substrates right and so you can see one is with the i'm going to pull back on the polyester side in this example in the picture and then the other side i'm going to pull back on the forming film side and so the question is will the system peel strengths be the same if i pull towards the C film side or towards the polyester side? And the answer is no, it will not be. And why is that the case, right? Because there are different energy forces that are required, right? Because different materials are deforming, right? Different things are deforming as I pull that apart. So now we're gonna go into kind of a, a real live example. This is just kind of one data point, one example, right? Now, in this particular case, you can see that we are bending back towards the polyester, right? It's gonna bend back towards itself on the left-hand side. Excuse me, on the right-hand side, we're gonna bend back towards the forming film. Forming film, polyester, poly, one, we're gonna bend back towards one side, right? So in this example, it would be this way, or we're going back this way. So we're gonna pull this way, or we're gonna pull this way, right? See, or forming film or polyester, poly. And what we found is this. If I bend back towards the polyester poly, my system peel strength in this particular example was 1.91, okay? Now, in the second sample, what you can see is that the seal strength, I'm sorry, the peel strength is 1.17, okay? So why is it that case? What is it? So we were able to do uh, an, uh, uh, a, a, an analysis of the materials, right? So we did a finite element analysis of the materials to actually quantify where those energy absorption points were coming from. And this is what we found, right? That first G sub C is the same. It's the same, it's gonna be the same for both materials, right? Pulling it apart will be the same. But when you look on the left-hand side, you can see the, the, the polyester poly. And when we further break it down, we can see the polyethylene is actually contributing 1.17, right, of that 1.91, right? And then the polyester is also contributing, and the C film is not. And if we look on the right-hand side, you can see that the contribution from the polyethylene is 0.22 when we do it the other way, right? So let me explain what's going on. So if I was to look at this, and I am pulling back towards the film, right, towards the film side, what happens is that here at that edge, the polyethylene is deforming. It's, it's either elastic or inelastic. It's either stretching and permanently deforming or it's, it's absorbing and, and maybe comes back a little bit. But either the two of those things is what's occurring. And then that resistance is what's giving me a very high seal strength value. But when I turn it around the other way and I pull this way, What's happening is that I'm not deforming the LDPE on that side. Not as much, very little. I'm not deforming 
the polyester. So I'm not getting that much of an energy contribution, right? And so you can see here in this example, right, we're using a forming film and even the forming film is not contributing greatly to the value that we are seeing on the instrument, right? So very important point here. When we do peel strength data, we're not only measuring the seal integrity, but we're also measuring the deformation that's occurring of the different materials that are involved in the entire package. And so further on, we got five important points that the system seal strength depends on, right? So the first thing is that true adhesion, right? What is that true adhesion that my material is having? That's the baseline, right? That's where uh, we'll talk more about that and why it's so important. And then what material is bending, right? So am I bending towards this way or towards this way? Which side is bending? And then even how much, all that, right? So that makes a big difference in terms of the value that we can get, right? And then the material in each layer is important. So let's say we have a five layer material and they're, all five layers have the same exact thicknesses, but one has a nylon core and the other one, let's say, has a polypropylene core. Not a very common structure, but just for an example. The mere fact that there's a difference between the two in terms of stiffness in the materials and their interactions with the other layers, we will actually get a different seal strength just by changing the material in the layer. And, and so it's not just the surface that will give you a difference. It's also the rest of the film that actually makes a difference in terms of what your seal strength value will be, right? The other thing you know, also is that layer stacking sequence. So if we change the stacking of the sequence or the thickness of different layers, we're going to get a different seal strength. Even if we keep the sealant layer, the sealant layer to the other side, if we keep that one the same exact one because of the interaction of other materials, because of the elastic and inelastic deformation and the combination of all of that, we are going to get a different seal strength. And then on top of that, and finally, the stiffness of material comes into play. If, Jose, we have another question after yeah, you're um, well, done with this. Okay, perfect. So if we have if we have a stiff material like this is a 1073B here, and thank you from uh, our team in Japan that uh, provided me this sample so graciously. Um, here we have some 1073B, fairly stiff, and if the other side is stiff or not stiff, or just as stiff or less stiff, that those combinations will make a difference in terms of the system peel strength. So yes, Jen, what is the question? So the question is, if I have two different material combinations and I test them and come up with the same peel strength value, does that mean they have the same G sub C? No. So G sub C, oh wait, let me ask it again, one more time. If I have two different material combinations, uh -huh. and they come out with the same peel strength for both of them, does that mean that they have the same G sub C? No, they don't. So G sub C, we'll talk about where and how we can get that. But see, having the same peel strength, right, and which I think is what you're asking, not seal strength, but having the same peel strength, right? So when Correct. I open it and on the instron, I'm getting the same exact number. You have deformation of materials that's occurring and that deformation of materials, we need to try to quantify and understand, all right? But let, I, I wanna shift the thinking away a little bit from G sub C for a second. We're gonna talk more about that in, in a little bit. I just wanna talk about when we are measuring on an instrument following F88, we're not just measuring the strength required to keep those that seal together. We're also measuring what's going on with the materials themselves, right? And let's go into an actual example of that. And I hope that this will help answer the question a little bit more. But great question because it really kind of leads naturally into this one. So at, at DuPont, we, we, we love to do uh, a lot of science and we love to do, uh, you know, really try to understand what's going on. And as I said, we opened 1.1 million packages. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of experience and knowledge that was developed in this particular test here right we took 200 samples not one not five not 10 not 20 but 200 samples in each orientation so when you see there where it says the polyester bend so this is this pouch right 
So where it says the polyester bend, it would be this. So I'm pulling back on the polyester. That will be all the yellow dots that you see on there, right? Free tail is I'm just pulling it and letting it just open and the tail heel will go in any direction that it wants. And then Tyvek bend, I am back, bending back towards the Tyvek itself, right? And that's the dark blue or where it says Tyvek bend. I want you to notice a slew of things. We could spend an entire hour on this chart because it's giving us an incredible amount of information. First, as I'm pulling back this way on the film side, the yellow dots, right? What you are seeing is a great variability in peel strength data, right? There's a great variability. It just varies because that elastic and inelastic deformation is at its greatest. And so now we are introducing that deformation from the film on the reading that we're having on the instra. When we're doing free tail, the natural geometry of this will just peel, but then we have uh, also a wide variation. And then when we go to the Tyvek side, it's a, a lot more consistent in terms of the data that we will get back because we are minimizing the amount of deformation that's occurring from the polyethylene side, the polyethylene polyester side. Okay, but here's a here's a thing. Here's an example. So let's say I have a uh, uh, some company says to me, hey, Jose, we have a one pound minimum on my Tyvek pouch, and I just got a pouch back, and it's 0.987642 that I got off the Instron, and it fails because it didn't meet my one pound minimum. And I'll go, hmm, and I break out this presentation, and I break out this slide, and I go, how many samples have you tested? What is the range? What is your standard deviation of that number? Is that, it's not an absolute number that you get. You get a number, but that's not a number that may be repeatable. And just from this data set that you're seeing before you, those yellow dots, it's a huge range. It's a huge standard deviation, right? Here's the same pouch, right? On this side, peeling back towards the film, great pouch, this thing's awesome. I'm getting up to like five pound, you know, I'm getting four pound. Oh, it's averaging a three pound strength. This is an awesome pouch. And I start pulling it on the Tyvek side. Oh my God, it's just barely over a pound. Oh, look at all of these failures that I'm having. A bunch of them are below one pound. Same pouch. I pull this way. It passes with flying colors. I pull this way. Oh my God, I could be failing a whole slew of numbers, right? But it's still the same pouch. So really want to be very careful with kind of an, uh, a general absolute to the number when it comes to peeling, that there really is a lot of stuff that's going on with that deformation, okay? It's just a lot of stuff and it's not as clean and it's not as precise as one number. Uh, do we have a question or are we good? We good? Yeah, we do. Um, oh. So the question is, what influence does cohesive separation versus adhesive separation influence the outcome? Oh, tremendous amount. So tremendous amount. So if you have a cohesive failure, and those that aren't familiar with cohesive technology, it's basically you have various layers of a film. One layer, let's say, let's say it was Tyvek, all right? So we're just going to take Tyvek, and then we have all these various layers. It's a multiple layer film. The layer that touches the Tyvek will seal permanently. It won't come apart. It will actually stay on the Tyvek. Then the next layer inside, or maybe the layer before that, depending on the technology, there's, let's just say a layer inside of that, when you go to peel open, it will fracture through that layer. And so what happens is there is no deformation that's occurring because the film is actually fracturing and it just fractures. It's, it gets to a point and then fractures. There is no added resistance. There's no deformation. So when it comes to a cohesive separation, your seal curves usually ramp up and then they stay flat, right? They have a, a range in which they're flat and that's because there's no contribution that's being added by the deformation of materials. Big difference. But when you have direct sealing, you're gonna have these variations that are occurring because of the deformation that's occurring on the film. So that's actually uh, a very good question. And then uh, from a technical term, right? So this would be an adhesive separation, right? From a technical term, but I also wanna clarify, there's a difference between that an adhesive separation and having a coating. And, and coatings behave more like a cohesive split. 
So the coating will actually fracture. And so then the coating is what will actually give. And so the coating is not going to give you this added deformation from the film side, right? So good question. And we're actually gonna talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on, but uh, it's, uh, it's a good one to bring up here now. This is polyester, I'm sorry, this is Tyvek to 48 gauge polyester. Now, over here, we did the same thing again. And this time we took 1073B with a heavy gauge film, right? Again, 200 samples of each one, right? For a total of 600 samples, right? And now this is, this is something that's quite interesting. So I'm gonna have a, a, a Tyvek 1073B. And then on this side, I'm gonna have a film that's just as stiff as a Tyvek is, okay? So it's gonna be, you know, an eight, 10 mil, you know, something, you know, pretty hefty. And most people would say, wow, that's a really good, very strong package. It's great from a puncture resistance standpoint, right? Because it's got, it's both sides are strong and stiff and everything else, great package, right? But what's gonna happen? Because both materials are stiff, there's not gonna be one material that's going to dominate or the form as much as the other material because they're both just as stiff. And so you can see shows up in the data. So you can see where the Tyvek bend, the dark blue, right? Got a lot of dots. It's a little bit higher, right? It's a little bit higher. The film bending side, oh, that's a little bit lower. And the free tail is right there. And they're all about the same. So there's going to be a really nice, a much better consistency when I have two similar stiffness type materials. But What's going to happen if I have some artificial number? And uh, you know, we can talk about Jeff Pavey did a wonderful presentation at Health Pack a few years back about the myth of one pound and where that came from and why we use it. And really, if you were to have a one pound minimum, that very good 1073 pouch or the very good thick film on the other side would fail a whole bunch of times because it's not meeting that arbitrary one pound minimum. So we have to rethink this whole sense of one pound minimum and what that means, right? And is it really what we should be setting as a specification, right? But more on that later on. Let's get back to the, the data here. So what happens is if I have two similar stiffness material and I go to do a free tail pull, because one side is not any more stiff than the other, you're pretty much gonna have a 90 degree tail. Where this one, because one is more, you can see how it comes up. You can see that tail angle is different, but if it, they were similar stiffness materials, they would not vary. They would be 90, and that shows in the bottom chart that you're seeing on your screen. This also happens when I have two thin materials, right? So in today's world where we're down gauging, you have two thin materials, and they're both similar stiffness. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to have field strength that are lower in value, but does that mean that the seal is going to be any less or any worse because really what we can kind of look here and what I really want to try, try to draw everyone's attention to is most of the time during the F88 testing when the numbers become quite high what we're measuring is deformation inelastic deformation elastic deformation doesn't matter we're measuring deform deformation that's occurring and we're going to get a high variability on our peel strength, right? And so let's just be careful in terms of setting an arbitrary number and also know that the data that we're getting is much more variable, right? So our quality folks who want to kind of hang their hat on, we just did a seal strength I here. I, this one is below one pound. This one, this particular sample, we got to reject stuff. We might want to reconsider that, right? And we want to reconsider what we want to do and how we want to talk about our peel data okay all good so far everyone so the experience that we have in terms of the peel strength right it's going to depend on a whole bunch of different things right it's going to depend on the type it's going to depend on the shape and the size and the materials that we're using right i'm a i'm a big fan of how big should this this flap be here it should be about this big so that you can kind of grab it go grab it open it and present it in the sterile field when it's too small, what happens? You get a lot of handling issues going on, but possibly contaminating the material. And then when you go to open it, you could contaminate the sterile field, right? 
So package design plays a lot in this feel strength that we experience. The chevron, that chevron is important. The higher the angle of the chevron, when we have that point of initiation, the easier it will peel open because you don't have as much of an area that is in seal. So we can actually mechanically engineer into it an easier peel open feature by changing the chevron, for example, right? Now, how are we testing today? So we test with free tail, we test supported, as you saw in that fixture earlier, or we support it bending one way or the other, or orientation Tyvek side up, or film side up, all of these things, right? And all of these things are going to affect how a customer feels or how we feel when we open it. What is that feeling that we're getting in the opening of a package, right? It's things to take into account. Jose, so, we do have another question. Yes. Um, is there a recommended specific um, F88 test method that's the best for us to use? So ASTM, right, is a is a, a consensus organization. So a bunch of people come together and they all talk and debate. And I, I was an ASTM member once and believe me, you debate and talk. You can talk about a word for 20 minutes that you want to have in there or not. But anyway. It's a consensus organization that dis, that kind of comes to an agreement how we're going to test something. And then that test is then usually validated and you do round robin testing and all kinds of things. F88 is the current way that we are testing. And having this data, really, and you led into the next slide perfectly, right? What is really that F88 data telling us, right? It's really telling us and measuring what force it takes to open, right, to open that package. But what are we measuring? We're not only measuring that intrinsic adhesion, but we're also measuring the deformation of materials occurring when we open. This is the best test that we have today for this, right? We just need to be aware of what is occurring when we open something, and then we need to make some decisions. Part of the reason that I wanted to start to have these presentations is really for us as a community and as an industry to really understand what's going on first and foremost, and then to start discussions and formulate ways that maybe we can come up with a better test, maybe, or to understand what the limitations of this test are, and that when we get this data back, that we use it in a reasonable way, right? So there is no perfect test that's going to give me this intrinsic adhesion, and I'm going to talk about that. I haven't gotten to that. We're going to get to the physics of that in a second. Okay. So hopefully that answered your question. If it doesn't, by the way, if I don't get to your question, you want to follow up, just feel free to send out another uh, a question to us, and I'll follow up on that again. There's another question that just came up on 88, and um, the fact that there's three different test methods available in there, and that um, this customer has tried all three of them and they get all um, different readings. So I think that kind of goes back to the slide earlier on in the presentation showing the different angles and how um, you get different readings out of that. Correct, so, and it's not that you have, uh, you know, I'm sure you didn't, it's not that you have, you, you have three different methods or recommended methods, right? So one would be 180, so it would be 180, the other one is free tail. Right, and then the other one is, you know, you can do whatever you want, and, but you have to quantify it. Um, and so, yes, you are absolutely going to get different measurements because, as you see here, yellow dots, you're going to get those when you bend towards the film. The the fuchsia dots here on the left hand side, you're going to get those kinds of numbers, and then the Tyvek bending side on the other side, you're going to get those kinds of numbers. So there is going to be a difference. What you need to do is pick one and decide on which one you're gonna test and you're gonna test consistently on that one. And then you gotta make sure that your supplier, the SPM who's providing you the pouch, they're testing in the same way too. So you have at least a relative discussion that you can have of like, this is what I'm usually getting and this is what I'm getting. The other thing I'd recommend is do this test for yourself and take 200 samples and test and find out what your standard deviation is. God bless you and if you're gonna to try to find a CPK value, but you might, get one, but then I wouldn't go there. But it gives you a range. It gives you an understanding of what's happening in your system or in your package relative to seal strength. Hopefully that answers it. And again, if it doesn't, just uh, send another email back in. 
So we have two more questions um, right now. One is um, if the secondary film is biaxially oriented, clearly easy for me to say, um, with a different ratio or machine direction um, versus cross direction, does the peel value change according to the direction of peel? That's a great question. And then I'll ask the other one after you answer that one. All right. So for those who, who don't understand, so you have uh, films that you can orient, right? So you, you literally stretch them, right? And if you stretch them in one orientation, it's just one orientation. If you stretch it in this or if I was to stretch this, this orientation and this orientation, I would have by actually oriented in two axes, I would orient the film, right? I would stretch it and impart different properties. This is commonly done with nylon films, for example, a nylon film and some other films, polyester as well, some other films. As you stretch it in orientations, you're going to get different its strengths is going to change the properties of the material by orienting it actually in one in one dimension or in two by actually orientation okay and so the question is if i have well by actually if i understand it correctly if i have one axis or am i oriented to in two axes what is going to be my, my my seal strength well your seal strength right not only depends on that layer that you're that you're stretching right that you're oriented but it also depends on what other materials are involved. So I would have to kind of come back to this chart. I'm sorry, I'm having to fly through this quickly, but it comes back to this chart. Oops, sorry, overdid it too quick with the fingers. So it comes back to this chart. So there it will affect it, but then there's other things that affect it as well. Now, how much would oriented versus non-oriented affect it? Don't know, that's part of the kind of experiential testing that needs to occur we just know that there will be a difference because of that interaction with the other layers how much is deforming how much is not deforming okay so they will vary i can't tell you whether it's going to go up or down or left or right it really is got to be other factors all these five factors come into play in terms of how much of a variability or where let's say it will move up and down in the scale of whatever system seal strength we look at so hopefully that covered it. And then Jen, you said you had one other question. Yep, the last one that I have right now is, what if both of my materials are the same um, on both sides of the pouch? Yeah, both materials are the same. It's gonna be close to this, this chart that I'm showing right here, okay? It's gonna be pretty much, you know, you have the same stiffness and the same material. That interaction is going to be fairly the same, right? But remember, oh, not remember. I've got to get, so give me about five slides and let me talk a little bit about the science and then we'll come back to it, okay? Uh, what's happening is that uh, this deformation, the elastic and inelastic, which we're going to cover in a little more depth, is actually, it varies. The film at one point can stretch more than it does before, just a millimeter before. This, this new next section will give a little more than this one will, or stretch, or deform, inelastically, or elastically, and so then your numbers will still vary. You're never gonna get a very consistent, precise number, even using the same two materials on both sides, okay? Because there's variability in the films in terms of how they deform. So, great questions so far. Keep them coming. Uh, anything else, Jen? Not right now, but time check, it is um, 50 oh. minutes after the hour. Okay, time check. Wow, I talked way too much. So what are we measuring when we're talking about F88, right? Dude, it's all been good. You're doing great. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, so what is the true force to keep something together, right? So we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, let's talk about what's happening to our package, right? What is going to challenge my seal integrity? First, pack out. So if I'm taking the product and I'm putting it into a box, right, that is going to affect my seals. If I have a coated material, it's not very breathable, right? Or it's not as breathable as an uncoated. Let's just put it that way. And so my ability to push the air out and put it into a box is going to be better with an uncoated. But if it's coated, it's got to be coated and I'm trying to compress it, well, I could blow out the seals or I could stress out the seals. So that's one of the challenges to seal integrity. Second is sterilization. When you have EO sterilization, for example, what you're doing is EO is a chemical that's explosive actually. And so what you wanna to do to minimize any explosion in a chamber is you extract the air out, you extract the oxygen out, and you put an inert gas in like a nitrogen. So you're gonna do what are called nitrogen flushes. You pull out air, nitrogen goes in, pull out air, nitrogen goes in. 
well, that vacuum in and out is actually going to expand your package in and out and can blow seals or put stress on your seals, okay? Distribution, shock, vibration, getting from point A, the truck, whatever, all this kind of stuff, that can put stress on your seals. Please, if you are packaging, please don't ship like this because then the weight ends up on the seal and you're gonna end up with a lot of trouble. You're better off like this so that there's no weight on seals. Just throwing that out there. Air transfer. So if I'm going from low altitude to high altitude in the plane, my product's going to Denver, which is a high altitude city here in the US or Mexico City, let's say, or you know some other high altitude uh, cities out there in the world, that is that doing anything to the product, right? Is that doing anything to the package? I gotta make sure that I'm not stressing and blowing out seals. And finally, end user handling, right? The last hundred yards, the last hundred meters, what's going on at the very end, right? So I've seen nurses take a package and they'll go like this and they'll just put it in their pocket with the product and they'll just like stuff their packets and off they go. Well, am I blowing out a seal there? Am I doing something to the seal there, right? So we want to make sure that that seal stays together throughout those challenges, right? And so we've done a lot of studies in the shock and vibration area to kind of have a correlation of shipping and understanding that we need to do work in terms of the correlation of what happens in the last 100 feet or the last 100 yards, right? But for this sake, we're just going to try to make sure that whatever the seal is, it stays intact. Through some... Uh, so here's the part where we talk a little bit about the science, right? And so what happens is here that you can see that at this little red dot area here, that red area there, right? You can see we're trying to measure what's happening before we peel something. And then, I'm sorry, and then we're gonna try to measure what happens during peeling. And then we're gonna try to measure what happens after peeling, right? So in science, we always deal with ideal states. So if we have an infinitely rigid string, right? And that would mean that that top line, that black line would be infinitely rigid. There would be no issues with it. Then we can come up with a very simple formula with what's happening during the peeling of my material. But the reality is that real films, real materials are not infinitely rigid. And so then the formula is much more complicated, right? Because we have elastic interactions and inelastic interactions that are occurring if it's a multiple layer of film across the different materials, across the different stiffness, across the different seals between those layers. If it's a monolayer or polyethylene layer, you know, it's stretching elastically and elastically. There's a lot more things that are going on. It is much more complicated, right? We can do the science. We have the science. We have the math. But this math would be clouded where we wouldn't be able to get a very good number because of the incredible variability of that deformation that's occurring, okay? And some other work that we did and uh, what we found through some basic research is that adhesion forces or G sub C or intrinsic adhesion, right? This force is the predominant mechanism that keeps the product the package together that is the predominant mechanism of seal is that g sub c value that intrinsic adhesion right that is really the more important number more than the peel number because the peel is just adding this plus all the deformation and all the other stuff that's happening okay? but this is the dominant force right that's holding my package together so earlier there was a question about g sub c and how can we measure it and here's how we can measure it, we're gonna go into it, right? But first, just want everyone to understand that this is what keeps the product together, and this is what the more important number is. But it's a little more complicated. So at DuPont, we did this, we did a test, right? And we came up with this very specialized fixture, real special fixture. On the bottom, you see a bar that's going across the bottom, right? And the the the, the whole unit that you see that's there, that actually slides along that bar. It's on a frictionless bearing system, right? And so what happens is as I pull on the instrument, what happens is that the whole thing will move so that the angle is kept constant. That angle that you see there is going to stay constant because the whole bottom part is going to move so that that angle can stay the same. So the sample is, is, is placed on that metal and it's firmly held as you can see there. 
and then we're just going to do a pull up and measure and keep the angle the same. We can change the angle up and down and measure like at this angle and measure at 45 or measure, we can just change the measurements that we want and just hold it constant and run a lot of instruments and a lot of chords. We did that, okay? We're, we're crazy enough to do that. And we did that with five to 700 pulls, right? Five to 700 pulls. And what you see here is a very busy chart, but here in this chart, there's a lot of really great information. So here, these series of red dots, right, is at 180 for this little line that you see here. And then this next one here, right, is, uh, excuse me, 150, and then 135, 120, oops, oh, oh, sorry, 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 uh, 90 degrees, 60 degrees, 45. What happens is that if you do enough pulls and you get a big data set, then you can run some great statistics. And the bigger the data set, as you know, then the better the, the, the outcome of your statistical number will be. But we run a least square curve fit, right? Statistical modeling number package, whatever you want to call it. We run that with all this data and we were able to then calculate what the G sub C is. Because with Tyvek, it's not easy to pull it apart with another package. The Tyvek usually comes apart from the center just because of the way it's engineered. And so there's no real great way or mechanism to do that with, but you can do it through math by changing the angles, taking all that, running an analysis, and then we're able to get a G sub C. Is this practical? Absolutely not, completely practical. I don't know anyone who's done this and uh, I, I have not seen this done anywhere else. And I am very grateful for DuPont. I'm to, grateful for our, our science heritage and I'm grateful for our engineers. A big shout out to Richard Jackson, who was uh, kind of the lead uh, rocket scientist on this, right? And him and his team and, and some other folks as well, ran a lot of this data and a lot of this analysis to first quantify and understand field data, and then make sure that when we are talking that something is functionally equivalent to something else that we have done the science to understand that it's functionally equivalent and that we can kind of take the noise out of the system and come up with something that can be relatively robust in terms of saying this is fairly similar to that, right? So thank you to DuPont for doing the science. I do not believe the industry will do this. I don't think there's a need for it. I think there's just too much variability in the data. As you can see, just looking at a 90 degree peel, look at the range up and down in terms of the number that we are generating, right? So, Getting to, Jose, I have a couple of questions when you yeah. uh, ready for you when you're ready. Perfect. So getting to say that, uh, that, that let's go do the calculation, let's find out what G sub C is. Okay, we can find out what G sub C is, but it's not going to be easy and it's going to require too much data. And so it's not practical, right? But what is important to understand is that this intrinsic adhesion is really what's the dominant force when it comes to a package staying together. So Jen, questions, go ahead. So the first one is, um, why are some of the red um, lines at the different angles so long compared to the other ones? And then the second one is, um, do you think that there will ever be a way to measure G sub C on its own without the material deformation? No. So uh, the, it's red. Those are long. Those are actual points. And so that's the range of high to low of numbers that we generated for that particular angle. So huge variability. So it's like looking at all those yellow dots, but instead of looking at those yellow dots scattered, we put them in one line at one angle, right? One angle, one fixed angle, and you can see the variability that goes up and down. And uh, no, and on the G sub C, it's just, it's not an easy thing to calculate. And it's not something that you can just do with one test or, or one number it really requires uh, a lot of statistics, a lot of numbers, a big, a big data set of uh, because deformation is always occurring and deformation is not consistent. It's highly variable. The amount of elastic and inelastic deformation will occurring, super variable. So we can't easily calculate a G sub C. We could if it was not, if that deformation was always the same or consistent across two materials. It's just not. So no, we can't, we can't do that. Any other questions, Jen? 
but good question. Not right now. Perfect. So thank you. You guys are great. I love these questions coming in. They're awesome. So here, we're at the end. And I want to, us to consider some points, right? So this 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 presentation wasn't more of here's what we're where we need to go. It's more of, hey, here's the data, here's some of the facts, and let's all talk about where we need to go. Right. So the first, measuring GCPC practical? Absolutely not. It is not practical. But by doing so, by doing this, by doing the science that DuPont did, we learned a lot. We just learned a lot in terms of variability of data, in terms of the huge standard deviation, in terms of the data sets that you need to run are quite large, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of peels that you have to run to kind of get any semblance. Actually, we run thousands to try to understand what's happening between different materials, right? So. GCPC is not practical, but it's important because it helped us understand the large level of variability that occurred. A focus on true adhesion versus peel strength for better packages, right? So someone comes to me and says, oh, I love this pouch. It's four pounds when I pull it this way. Oh, this pound, is, this package is failing. It's one pound. Seriously, this is a good package. All I'm doing is measuring deformation. That's not that intrinsic adhesion. That does not make this a bad package because it dropped below a pound when I'm testing this way and I'm not getting deformation, right? So we have to get a little more um, practical, it might be the word, right? In terms of now that we've understood the science and some of the, the information that we found, right? That we have to treat this information in a little more kind of a practical way for real world and real life applications, right? So, as, as the world is down gauging, right, right? If you have, or even remember that stiff 1073B with a stiff film on the other side, those values were low compared to this because no energy contribution, because, or energy absorption, because we weren't deforming materials, right? So, as I go to two thin materials and I make those together and I have a low peel strength, does that mean I have a bad package, right? Do I have a bad package because I have a lower seal peel strength? Maybe not. In some cases, absolutely not. Because why? Because it's not measuring deformation. It's measuring a very little amount of deformation. It's really measuring more of some of the other stuff that's going on, right? Again, lots of analysis, maybe more discussions to talk about this, right? But this artificial one pound, we have to kind of move away from that. We have to kind of decide on a seal that works based on, let's say, let me take a step back and talk about something. The best way to come up with maybe what seal strength I should have is let's say I have a form fill seal line and I have a product and I'm gonna go run a validation. So I run a validation and I'm running the material through all the different you know, dwell times and temperatures and pressures and whatever. And what I'm going to do is that the low end is where it's got a good seal, right? But not as strong. And then we have a nominal and then we have our high and it's ripping and tearing. And so we're going to find a window, an operating window of those two materials that I'm going to operate. In. And I run my whole validation within those operating window. And I do my distribution shock, all my testing. And then afterwards, if that passed, then I can come back and say, here's my nominal. Now, what's my peel strength of that nominal package? And you'll be surprised. Some of those nominal packages could be 0.8 pounds, 0.6 pounds, 0.9 pounds. It could be a lot less than that one pound minimum, but because it just survived your distribution channel, you know that that seal strength just passed, right? Your criteria. And so it doesn't need to be some artificial number like one. It doesn't need to be some high thing where I am now stressing out my materials, okay? So again, a lot of real practical implications and things that we need to kind of study and think about, right? Jose, to interject there for a second too, uh -huh. um, just so everyone on the line knows, ASTM is in the process of developing a method for determining how or what your minimum peel strength needs to be. Um, it's not released yet. It's still in final discussion, um, but it should be released hopefully sometime soon within maybe the next year or so. Yep, so, so be looking at, or be on the lookout for that. Yeah, and you know, I think if you want to get involved, uh, get involved with ASTM or Amy or IOP or 
you know, uh, ISO, whatever it is that, uh, you know, you can provide input and also find out a little bit more about some of the work that's being done out there in industry to kind of come up with a standard. But thanks for that, Jen. Yeah, that's, that's important. Uh, how variable is your F88 peel strength data? I think we should all run at least 100 samples um, from the same position on the same pouch and see how variable your data is to try to at least get some statistics going and some semblance of understanding of what my standard deviation is and how variable that number is so that when I say it's, you know, it didn't meet my one pound, well, what's your plus or minus on that, right? And you might be okay. So another way to kind of put around some of these things, right? And then how does this affect your quality systems? If your quality systems are set to one data point, you know, if one data point comes down below a certain threshold, I don't know, you might want to reconsider that and at least you have some uh, ammunition to talk to your uh, quality folks. And, and we, we may end up doing this presentation again, we're under discussions, but if we do, I'd, I'd invite you to invite your quality folks to listen to this and, and they can ask questions to really kind of try to understand what's going on here, right? And then earlier, great question on cohesive and adhesive films. Those materials don't deform because they fracture along the cohesive film portion or through the coating portion. So those materials really don't have as much play or, or issues. So if you have a rigid tray with a coated Tyvek on top, it's the coating that will give. Once you set it, once it gets to the right point, it gives and then it just fractures. It should be a fairly flat line. If there is some kind of variability, it goes up. Another issue to be discussed, there are some other things at play if that's occurring with those materials. And then putting a minimum one pound, let's say, was that causing undue stress on my thinner materials or even my thicker materials or any material? I'm trying to get some artificial number that's just going to induce fiber tear or that's going to induce some other issues because I'm trying to reach some number. And so maybe we don't need to do that, right? If we can survive our distribution channels, right? If we can survive to the point of use, that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter what the number is. It matters that it survives from point A to point B, right? And then finally, you know, this understanding of peel versus seal strength, right? I just really I want to come back and emphasize, at least from my definition of that, this peel, right? I'm sorry, this this peel, right, is different than seal. And so we have to start thinking of those things differently. And that what's most important is seal strength and making sure that we have the appropriate seal strength for our distribution till the point of use. Okay. And so uh, that uh, kind of concludes our, our presentation. And if you want to contact us, feel free to contact us here, as you can see, and, uh, uh, on our website at medicalpackaging.dupont.com or on LinkedIn, which, uh, you know, just go to LinkedIn and look us up, medicalpackaging.dupont.com. And we are there and uh, ready and able to answer any more questions. And I think Jen has a few other items as well that we can. I do, I do. So <laughs> thanks for a great session, Jose. Um, what a great bonding experience. I just love puns. Um, there was some great cohesion happening on the call. So every time I hear this presentation, I have to say I learned something new. Thank you for um, sharing with, the, with, with us and with me again. Um, to be able to separate the actual bond um, or that seal strength from the material properties um, through the peel testing that we do is pretty cool science. Um, I'll, I'll also like to thank you, our attendees, for spending time today to join in the conversation about the physics and science of sealing from Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging. Um, and following the closing of this webinar, we will be sending out a quick survey via email, so please take a few moments to answer some questions regarding this webinar, um, as well as uh, potential other webinars that we have um, for offering or that things you might be interested in. Your anonymous feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us improve for, for future webinars. That said, um, please hang on because I'd like to now open it to our formal question answer period. And so if you didn't have a chance to ask your question during the presentation, please send those in now. Um, I'll start with a few that came up um, that I didn't have a, an opportunity to ask during the session. So, um, Jose, did you guys perform this testing on rigid trays, i.e. HIPS, PETG, and if so, um, were the results also impacted by the angles? Uh, no, we didn't, but uh, again, it goes back to that comment of cohesive technology and coatings. 
they fracture and so there's not deformation of materials that are occurring because the break point is in that cohesive layer or that break point is through the adhesive or is through the coating itself. And so in that particular case, there is no uh, contribution of deformation or if there is, it's very minimal from, uh, from that. So the coatings the, you know, just fracture and you get a pretty flat and so you're not going to get, you know, that variability. So you're going, if you need a very, very, a very consistent number, you would want to use uh, a coated or cohesive film. And really, when it comes to rigid trays, they're going to be fairly consistent because it's the coating that you're measuring, the fracture point of the coating. Good question. All right. Um, our next question is EN 868-5 tells us what should be the minimum peel force value for preformed pouches. Is this applicable for other types of packaging, e.g. packaging forming um, like form fill seal through a multivac? I am not a fan of any, spence, any uh, specification that sets a standard uh, in terms of what the minimum peel value is or a peel value. Um, uh, this, this is an older uh, test and um, I would love to see the data they came from. Uh, I have not seen data like this and if they generated data like this, I'd like to see it that backs up what that minimum number is or why that minimum number or who set and how was that number set. Um, so not a fan of that because I don't know that there's a lot of science and a lot of data to back that up in terms of what that minimum should be. Um, I think we need to be a little more practical from setting uh, minimum data or uh, RPO data number. It really should base, be based on, did it survive distribution? Did it survive my distribution for my product, for my package? And everybody's package and product and distribution cycle is going to be a little different and so each one will, will will have to you know do its testing i mean i've had customers who just change the orientation of the product inside the box you know in a certain way or nested them in a certain way they were failing before they nested them differently and it passed right and so you know i'm talking on the seal side of things right and so there's so many more variables involved that setting some arbitrary minimum number i just not a fan of that, and I would not um, I would not call that out or use that just because uh, I don't uh, it might be a over engineering or or stressing out your materials or doing things, or b you may be doing yourself a disservice feeling that somehow you're covered, but in reality, you may not be so. Excellent. Thanks, Jose. Um, there's another question, actually, that I'd like to kind of have a conversation with you about if this is possible. Sure. Um, the question is, is it necessary to, to assess a few locations of the package's peel um, or peel strength um, and measuring from the primary opening location? Is that sufficient? Um, it really depends on, on what you're after, right? So really depends. So if I have a package, and and I've got a preformed pouch, and this pouch is coming to me from my my supplier, right? So they're already giving me three sides of the seal, and all I'm doing is is the fourth one. You know, you may want to verify that their seals are good, and so then I may want to do those, and then I verify that my seal that I've made is good. So that's one philosophy or way of thinking of it. Now someone else may say. Okay, what I really want to focus on is my user experience and then how much is this? And so then I'm going to test in the opening of side of the package, right? That's a completely different philosophy in terms of testing why I'm doing that testing to really try to understand that that's occurring or not occurring, right? So one is trying to measure and trying to correlate like this, the, the integrity of the package all around by testing the seal strength of the package all around. One is like only the package, the seal that I've made because this comes pre-validated from my supplier. So I'm just gonna validate my seals. Other is what at the opening. So it really depends philosophically on your company and what uh, what approach you're taking to, to testing and what approach you're taking to actually looking at this, right? The other point I'll make is this. If I am going to test here, then I better label this, you know, here, and then only compare the data set to this point. 
because the data set from this point is going to be different than the data set from here and here and here and here and all the way around. So I always want to compare this, the same section, the same spot to all my other samples. So I would initially do a series of tests in different locations, run a bunch of them, and then run them for those specific locations and only compare that location to itself. And then you can run some other statistics, of course, to compare the whole package, but you will find variability that actually occurs in different sections of the pouch for, again, the deformation that it could occur in terms of different effects on that film, right? So earlier talked about orientation biaxially or axially oriented. You may make it stiffer or less stiffer when you pull it one way, but you turn it the other way and they give you a different result. So I would do that kind of thing. So Jose, another question is, um, would I expect to have a different value on the Chevron um, versus on the side seals yes. or even the seal that I create myself? Yes, 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 uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> on the Chevron, uh, yes, because remember, we're, 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 we're changing orientations in terms of how the film is sealed to the, to the Tyvek, right? Or to whatever, because this isn't just a Tyvek thing. And so then, how will that material deform? Uh, so, you know, films are either in blown film lines, right? So there's a kind of a tube and then they cut them or they're cast films. And so there's different properties in the film from a machine direction to a cross machine direction or orientation can come into play. And then what happens is I can just have a different number or a different level of deformation, right? So we learned that earlier different levels of deformation and that different level of deformation will give me a different number so that's why i would do that um, and then see what the variability is across and around the package so good question next question is is it possible to correlate the peel strength value that i get off of my instron with the user experience mm. I, I mean anything's possible right so yeah possible but I guess, um, you know, uh, when we go back to that chart, right, the yellow dots, that variability is, is my customer opening the yellow dot way or are they opening the dark purple dot way, right? So one's going to have a perceived higher seal strength, peel strength, right? And the other one's going to have a lower peel strength. And so one's going to deform less than the other. So it really depends on the customer and how they're opening. If you know they're going to open it in the same way, uh then yeah yeah you, you you could quantify that doing it this way but then it comes to how am i going to control my my peel strength like am i going to add more heat to that seal and do all these crazy things to try to change it uh i'd be very careful with that right um i think it's better to dial in a cohesive film because some cohesive films have different levels of strength that they can give you when they fracture uh, some adhesives do the same. I'm sorry, coatings can do the same thing. Um, so um, I think first and foremost, your product has to survive all those variables that I talked about, and then you know going point A to point B and all that. I think that's most important. And then uh, doing that in a way that doesn't stress out the materials. And uh, secondly, and then the user experience is usually ends up being unfortunately by default what is it that created all that if i could dial that in a little more uh and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's it's just now not easy at all it's hard and not even practical or possible so it really depends on how, how you approach it but good question thank you thanks jose i think we have time for one last question here and and this is kind of a biggie um are some companies um actually sorry uh, how are, how are regulatory authorities um, reviewing peel strength data in technical documentation? Oh, well, that is a big question. And so it depends on the regulatory body. It depends on where you are in the world. It depends on uh, even if like, you know, who your notified body in Europe is, right? Different notified bodies have, even the auditor, right? Could be completely different in terms of what they require or want to see kind of things, right? So from a regulatory standpoint, gosh, it's all over the place. But what I can tell you is this, when you do something, and if you do something, and if you have it documented as to why you did that, and you have the data that backs up 
what you've done. That's that's really the best that you can do, right? So I decided that my field strength is 0.6 because I did the distribution test and everything went through and everything passed the 0.6. And here's my lower end and upper end, and you know here's my all this other data, and I have it justified and validated that this is why why I did this and this is what I got. You know, again, it's about having all your answers right when they ask you those questions because they want to know that you did the work to validate right that this product and package will maintain its integrity at the point of use right so i think um jose it's also important to note that we've been hearing from different um downstream customers um more recently with the change to mdr uh, from MDD that notified bodies are asking for more of that supporting information and are not accepting that just because it's always been a pound or whatever it is for the company that that will continue to be acceptable. So uh, make sure that you are doing what, doc what Jose is indicating here and documenting um, whatever that strength is, how you came to that strength, why and justify that it does meet what the requirements are. Yeah, whatever you do, just make sure you have the reason and the rationale and something that makes sense in terms of why you do it and how it's working and that, that you can do it consistently and you can control that process. So easier said than done. There's a lot of work. Yeah, there. right. It it's, is totally. Easier said than done, right? It's a, it's a yeah. that, completely that much what I just talked about, right? In that 10 words, right? But yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you, Jose. And thank you, everyone, again. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, following the closing of this webinar, we will be sending out a quick survey. So please make sure that you reply to that. We want to make sure that we keep on bringing you um, good material that you want to hear. Um, and thank you again for your time today. If you'd like to follow up or are there any other others on your team that weren't able to make it today, please let us know. And keep an eye on your inbox for upcoming emails from our team. Uh, we look forward to talking with you again soon. We do have a global team of specialists ready to help you in your medical and pharmaceutical packaging needs. We'd love to connect um, further uh, through our global network. Visit us also at medicalpackaging.dupont.com. It's up on the screen right now. And then also follow us on LinkedIn, DuPont Tyvek Medical and Pharmaceutical Packaging, where we post all of our upcoming events and some great material as well that you can use in your day-to-day -day activities. With that, have a great day. Take care and be safe out there, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Good night. And good day if you're in the Asian. Thanks. Right. Yes. Thank you.